<clears throat> Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome, welcome to the first uh, monthly webinar of uh, 2022. Uh, my name is Michael Kramer. I am your the calibration inspection program manager presenting today on behalf of Perry Johnson Laboratory Accreditation. And today we are going to go back in history, one year actually, and look at the assessments that we did in 2021 and uh, see some of the um, common findings. Uh, basically, we have a top 10 list where we're going to look at the top 10 sections. Uh, so as always, uh, this assessment is, excuse me, uh, this webinar is being recorded. Um, the PJLA uh, recording uh, is available on, on the website. Uh, shortly thereafter this this particular webinar you can go back and re-listen to it or or share it if you desire or else uh, it, perhaps you just would like to uh, have the presentation slides go to our website uh, the webinar tab and you can ex uh, request those and they could be sent to you currently everybody is muted hopefully you can hear me but i cannot hear you um you have a question tab uh, box that you should uh, should be able to see. Um, as we're going along, if any questions come to mind, feel free to type into that tab. And at the conclusion of today's uh, um, webinar, I will go back and look at the questions uh, and try to answer to the best of my ability uh, those that were submitted. Please uh, keep the questions in regards to today's topic, which is actually going to be all over the place today because we're going to be looking at various sections of the standard. So again, uh, this this particular webinar is uh, uh, the top 10 list is what I like to call it. Uh, um, we're going to go back and at the PJLA, we've done assessments, we've collected some some data um, from the assessments that we we've done. Uh, this is strictly for 17025, 2017, and we identified the top 10 uh, list of sections in which uh, PJLA assessors wrote non-conformances. So we're going to look at these sections. Um, we're going to look at perhaps some of the highlights in the section, each section. Um, not going to go through a clause by clause. Um, we're going to look at the uh, example of uh, non-conformances that were actually written in regard to each of these sections that made the top 10 list. So uh, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. So uh, we're going to go from 10 to 1, uh, 1 being the area that had the most uh, non-conformances written. So uh, making it into the top 10 list here, section 8.3, uh, control of management system documents. Uh, <clears throat> i.e. document control. So this section is uh, is um, looking at documents, which of course is anything that tells a person in the laboratory what to do or how to do it, i.e. a procedure, a form, software could be considered a document. So just not to confuse it from records because records actually show what's been done. So uh, very first clause is uh, 831, and uh, this, this includes both internal and external documents. So um, what comes under the realm of document control is not just the uh, internal procedures that you might write or the forms, it's anything you bring from the outside world in. So for example, an ASTM or ISO type procedure that you don't write, that you adopt. And actually, I uh, can expand on this. If you're accredited through PJLA, uh, we have policies that you uh, um, we assess to, and that the, um, as a 17025 accredited CAB under an ILAC signatory, you have to comply with ILAC policies, which in turn we have our own policy. So included in external uh, documents uh, um, should very well be PL123, PL4 is applicable, and also SOP3, which is our symbol procedure. So controlling documents, internal and external, uh, standard gives a lot of flexibility here. Um, back in uh, before the standard was revised, we required a master list 
sort of was descriptive telling you you had to use a master list. Uh, no longer required. Um, however, um, I'm finding a lot of organizations like the concept of a master list and have incorporated into their 2017 quality, uh, 17025 quality management system and is able to utilize that to assure that internal and external documents are being controlled. However, I'm also seeing this accomplished through a sophisticated electronic documents control system, which links the entire quality management system together electronically. So uh, whatever works best for your organization, just got to assure everybody's on the same page um, as far as working off the current and latest, greatest internal and external documents. And also that you're able to ensure that the following is uh, being um, accomplished within your organization through document control. Um, we see the list here under 832. Of course, uh, documents have to be approved prior to to, to um, being implemented into your or your system by issued by an authorized uh, personnel, uh, not just ones, but uh, periodic reviews are are required and updates um, as necessary. Revision levels should be current and should uh, reflect the current status of the document within the document um, that the current revision levels are identified. All applicable do documents are available at point of use and their distribution is controlled. Documents are uniquely identified and uh, should have safeguard in place to prevent any usage of obsolete documents. So that, that's pretty much the core of the requirements in document control. Um, here's an example of a finding that was actually written during 20, uh, 2021. Um, Basically, a broad encompassing statement of the finding was the CAB. If you're not familiar, that is you all, the conformance assessment body, um, the laboratory that's being assessed in this, uh, this instance, has proven not to effectively control the documents related to the fulfillment of the standard. It is evident the documents have not been reviewed and updated as necessary. The master documents list, uh, documents list provided has not been kept up to date. And in this particular example, objective evidence that prompted writing this findings uh, stated there. During the assessment, three separate documents were submitted that all contain sections addressing the same requirements of the standard in difference and sometimes contradicting ways. All right, uh, number nine. Um, would be uh, section 8.9, management review requirements. So right off the bat, uh, 891, and uh, I, whenever a finding is written, I'll interject this now, the word shall is normally um, projected in the requirement. A shall is a requirement. The laboratory management shall review its management system at plan intervals in order to ensure its continuing suitability, adequacy, and effectiveness, including the stated policy objectives related to the fulfillment of this document. So the very first requirement is uh, plan intervals. So in assessing um, for a, uh, under this section, um, as an assessor, typically uh, the individual should be looking for the plan interval stated by your organization. This plan interval should uh, assure continuing suitability, adequacy of effectiveness, including your stated policies and objectives related to the fulfillment of this document is stated in that requirement. Um, so uh, ideally, first of all, you want to assure that you get your management review done according to your plan interval. As an assessor, I could tell you that's the first thing um, I look for is um, the uh, the plan interval and just uh, assuring that the uh, management review was completed uh, within that plan interval. I'd like to see a little bit of beef behind the management review. If, as you see, it uh, um, should be a, a tool to utilize as stated in here, continuing suitability adequately effectiveness adequacy and effectiveness including your stated policies objectives related to the fulfillment of this document 
When we say this document, of course, we're referring to the 17025 standard. And then we move on to uh, Clause 892. And I'm not going to go over all of these, but uh, it's divided into two, two parts here. We have 892 and 893, and we have a shall be recorded. So in other words, um, your management review, if done uh, within your plan interval, next thing uh, we need to assure is that you're taking into account and making a record of um, all these required inputs and outputs. So we see 892 uh, items that need to be addressed during the management review. And then uh, forces your hand a little bit here. And I'm surprised I, I, for myself, speaking on behalf of myself, often I'll find the struggling point 893 where the outputs are not recorded, but you see that shall record. So it's not just the inputs, it's the output. So assure that your management review is uh, at least taken into account 892. Looks like A through O with those items listed there. And then when you're finished, go back and reflect on the outputs, uh, 893. Uh, ask yourself uh, um, questions regarding, and you see right there, A through D. So we want to assure that it's done uh, during within your plan interval, that it is capturing all the required inputs and outputs. So uh, one way, of course, is to assure this in preparation of the meeting and to assure the inputs and outputs are, are required uh, outputs requirements are captured in an agenda. Uh, perhaps prepare a, a template or an agenda for conducting the management review. Uh, a to assure all the required inputs and outputs are being being captured. Uh, management review, of course, uh, we're going to be looking for that. It could also be used to include other items. So you can always do more during your management review. However, you can't do less. So assure it's being done between uh, within the plan interval, all required inputs and outputs are being captured. There's some beef behind uh, the dissertation there, just to um, assure that uh, um, the adequacy of your policies um, and um, procedures and everything is still um, current. If any need for changes are, are um, identified, that they are captured in the management review. Here's an example of a finding. When I was just discussing, uh, CAB did not discuss applicable out outputs during the management review. And uh, basically objective evidence is uh, when you finding is written, the objective evidence is what was seen or not seen, which uh, um, prompted the writing of the non-conformant. So in this particular instance, the record submitted for the management review, which was dated on August the 8th, 2021, included bullet by bullet evidence of discussion of required inputs, but did not record any evidence of discussing the relevant outputs. All right, uh, moving down the list here to number eight, uh, metrological traceability. So this is traceability to the SI, term that sometimes get uh, used and Toss around loosely, but it's a defined meeting, specific requirements in 17025. So uh, we need to assure that measurements, uh, when needed, are being uh, traceable. Um, in 17025, uh, we have some guidance in Appendix A um, and how to demonstrate traceability. So this is um, basically. You're measuring devices. When you're go measuring something, you have a equipment to measure, say, temperature, measure frequency, whatever it happens to be. It could be a, a balance uh, um, in a testing laboratory, uh, an analytical type balance. Uh, it's talking about the traceability of those measurements uh, achieved by those equipment um, or reference material. Um, so in a nutshell, I call these slam dunks. Uh, if you go through uh, the use of an NMI, National Metrology Institute. So you can go directly to, in the US, that is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or you can go to another laboratory that is accredited in order to assure traceable traceability, sure you're getting their traceable type of documentation. Um, and you're getting uh, uh, something that they're accredited to perform. 
uh, such as uh, one of our PJLA accredited labs who should not be accredited uh, calibration labs um, if they were not providing traceable measurements. Some of you testing folks uh, see utilize reference material. One way to assure um, traceability is going through a organization that is uh, 17034 accredited. These are all ways to assure traceability as specified in Annex A. So there's the requirement there. The laboratory shall ensure measurements results are traceable to the uh, international system of units through calibration provided by a competent lab. So there's a note that basically states uh, a lab fulfilling the requirements of 17025 are considered to be competent. Objective evidence that can support that would be a scope of accreditation. Uh, certified values of reference material provided by a competent producer. Again, 17034 accreditation would be a, uh, a, a objective evidence that could be presented to assure your uh, reference material producer that's claiming traceability is competent. There are some instances where direct relation of the SI unit ensured by comparison directly or in comparison with national or international standards. So now we also have, uh, I wanna interject some, some things in PL2 here because it sort of correlates uh, one, uh, excuse me, um, the requirements in 17025 section 65. Again, you could be uh, um, considered a, uh, um you could be providing a traceable measurements and not be accredited uh uh with uh we take this into account um and uh we have a protocol to follow um in this instance that's uh that's in harmony with the requirements of 17025 we have a form that needs to be filled out and particular objective evidence would need to be provided so if you happen to be using a provider who is not accredited who's claiming traceability and you want to continue to use that provider, um, you can still, uh, hopefully, still utilize them. Um, just have to show objective evidence of their traceable measurements. They said a uh, organization that was accredited, if the report contained a, say, a, a, the PJLA symbol, it was verified that the organization is uh, accredited to perform that um, particular calibration. Um, that's like a big stamp of approval, hence uh, this exercise that uh, specified here with the LF-123 would not be needed. So example of a non-conformance written, equipment used for gas flow calibrations are not supported with a traceable calibration certificate. And the objective evidence would be the current reports that were provided for this particular meter. Another example would be uh, perhaps your environmental um, devices where you capture and monitor environmental. If they're a reported to the customer and if they're uh, a contributor to your uncertainty, then they would also need to be um, traceable. So here's an example of a, instant, a finding was written where in this particular case, uh, those devices were being used, incorporated into the results. However, there was no objective evidence produced that they were even calibrated, um, let alone being calibrated by a traceable source. Moving on, uh, um, number seven going down the list here is section 6.2 personnel. So uh, quite a few requirements here. Um, I'd like to jump jump ahead to 625. The laboratory shall have procedures. So we see that word shall there. Procedure, something that tells you how something is done. And retain records, i.e. something showing that it was done. And we have a list of items there where we should have a, address these in a procedure and uh, should be... Uh, um uh retaining records for the for these various items here on getting with a determining the competence requirements such as job descriptions uh selection of personnel interview notes competencies cross-reference 
training of personnel, training attendance uh, agendas. What I'm reading off here are some, some records that could be produced. Supervision of personnel, a training record, signed off AE by the supervisor. Authorization of personnel. When someone is fully trained, uh, they and you want to authorize them to perform a specific test or calibration, um, that's a record that needs to be captured. Uh, this could be a simple authorization matrix or just a, a training record sign-off uh, that authorizes an individual, individual to perform a test or calibration on behalf of your organization. Monitoring, so this is something new, monitoring the competence of personnel. So again, you would need to specify how this was done, um, how this is done and records showing that it was done. And this could include such vehicles as checking, checking personal data and reports. Proficiency testing is something that's required anyway. Um, an organization is required to perform proficiency tests, include your personnel in there. Um, you can run your own intra-lab testing, for example, to, to um, check the um, uniformity of the results provided by your staff. Um, so uh, another thing is uh, personnel. The standard uh, 2017 is less repetitious. So it says all personnel of the laboratory, either internal or external. So if you're using contract personnel, uh, this would include them. So uh, one th couple things I like to key on is, for example, if your internal auditor is an internal employee, they need to f be authorized to do so, and you would have to define the competency requirements for an internal auditor. Folks that are doing purchasing uh, that are involved in the, the acquisition of critical supplies, perhaps equipment or calibration services, um, other Items, of course, would be anyone working or maintenance of any equipment. And as stated before, if you do utilize contract personnel, these same requirements would apply. So we had those authorization. I want to also touch on, we have another clause here under 626. The laboratory shall authorize personnel to perform specific laboratory activities, including but not limited to the follow following. So if you're involved in the development, modification, verification, and valid validation of methods, uh, those laboratory personnel would need to be authorized. Analyzing results, including statements of conformity, opinions, and interpretations, if they're included in your reports. And I highlight a C, because I this is one thing I would uh, have an inkling that uh, um, is captured often. Uh, in this area, if we um, broke them down into clause, is a uh, 626C report review and authorization of results. So, in other words, even if you're a single, even if it's the same person who is performing the test, and they're also authorizing the release of the report, checking it, uh, reviewing it before it goes out, there are two separate authorizations there: one to perform the test or calibration, and the other to uh, actually authorize, issue, and release the reports to your customers. So I just mentioned a, a, a it could be the same person for small organizations. I have seen that. and do require that the, it's specified that they're also authorizing the result, re results and also looking for that re record uh, to show that they are uh, authorized to not only do the test or calibration, but also uh, uh, issue and authorize the results uh, being issued to the customer. So this could be uh, an expanded matrix. Often we'll see an authorization matrix where you can include these other elements in here um, as an example of a record that can be produced. So example of a nonconformance written here would be, uh, like I stated, uh, um, uh, once someone is trained a, and an organization determined that they can perform the test or calibration independently, that individual would have to have a record uh, that they are authorized to do so. So this is an example of, a, and I changed the names on these examples and companies' names, as you could probably tell, to, um, for uh, confidentiality, um, if anything else. Uh, um, and here's an example of a finding that was written. 
The authorization to perform calibration on their ABC scale scope of accreditation is not being captured. So why was that non-conformance written? Reports for calibration performed for, for on 12-9-21 indicates that the bench floor and vehicle scales were all calibrated by John Doe. However, a record of these authorization to perform these calibrations were not produced as requested. All right, uh, moving on down the list. Uh, Common finding number six, internal audit. So uh, this is section 8.8. Eight. We looked at management reviews that was following this. That was uh, previous. Now we're going to look at internal audits where we're looking for compliance. So one thing here, uh, if your internal audit, uh, the laboratory shall define the audit criteria and scope of each audit. So here's an example of a, um, a defined, defining criteria and scope of an audit. Typically, if you're accredited with PJLA, and you're doing an internal audit. You want to assure that internal audits conducted are against the requirements of ISO 17025, 2017, applicable PJLA policies, and ABC company's own quality management risk system, and incorporates these requirements with laboratory operations of ABC calibration slash testing laboratory. So we're doing internal audits. We, de we define the scope and we're looking for compliance. We're looking for compliance to the standard for applicable accreditation body policies to your own quality management system. So if you're stating that you're complying in a certain manner, you want to go back and assure you're doing exactly what you state you're, you're doing in order to maintain compliance. Once again, uh, 881, a plan interval. So I could go and give the uh, um, spiel I did with management review, but uh, again, an internal audit, one of the first things uh, as an assessor, <clears throat> I'm gonna look for is that plan interval. So if you state annually, annually per calendar year, however it's stated, then I, I need to assure that that uh, internal audit is being conducted within that plan interval. And you want to assure that uh, you're you're complying with your own requirements of its management system, uh, including the laboratory activities. Again, this is you're going to and also not only these external documents that you're complying with your own internal documents. So even prior to doing an assessment, your assessor should be um, looking and doing a cross reference with you your quality management system you'll see that uh pjla headquarters may uh they well they do uh if if you're using them within your 17025 compliant quality management system to submit uh perhaps your quality manual and supporting procedures hence the assessor can uh, go back and see how you're maintaining c compliance and uh look at the objective evidence once they get there that you are assured doing what you're saying you're doing so uh, I have a little fr um, phrase there. Words are meaningless without intent and follow through. So basically uh, do as you say um, within your quality management system if that's how you're maintaining compliance. Also looking to conform with the requirements of this document. So that's the 17025 standard. Example of a non-conformance written, internal audit submitted does not support all the applicable requirements in 17025-2017 were audited. And the objective evidence that uh, was reviewed was the uh, particular internal audit that was conducted on this day. So with this, uh, perhaps uh, um, you need to be uh, auditing all applicable requirements and clauses, perhaps an internal checklist uh, we have one available on our website that organizations will use to assure that you go and you look at all applicable re requirements for example seven eight reporting the results um, you should be um, seven eight applies to you objective evidence that you were actually your internal audit incorporated you auditing the reports that you produce um, corrective action, that you're auditing the corrective actions that were um, performed by the organization and ensured all required elements were, 
where I'm at. Um, an internal audit is more than a two or three word, um, which was probably uh, the uh, objective evidence that was written in writing this finding, a, a one or two sentence dissertation stating everything was looked at and everything was fine. All right, moving along, uh, number five, which was methods, selection, verification, and validation of methods. So uh, here we have, uh, these could be uh, external methods. We're talking about external documents. Uh, um, it could be your internal, your laboratory developed procedure that you may be utilizing. So this section, it's uh, it's been organized mainly to differentiate between when a lab has to verify and when it has to validate. So one thing right off the bat, you have to use appropriate methods. So uh, our assessors, uh, PJLA assessors, we have experience in the areas that we, we assess. That's one way we identify competency requirements that you have to have practical experience in the particular uh, test or calibrations. Hence the assessor should uh, know when a method that's being presented is not an appropriate method to perform a, a specific um, test or calibration, which is on a proposed or an established scope of accreditation. So verify, uh, 7215, we're talking about verification. So before you actually um, give an example here of if you want to expand your scope and <clears throat> Let's say you want to start doing um, torque wrench calibrations, for example. You want to add them to your scope. You have to verify that you can actually uh, perform the procedure um, by, uh, um, could be done in, in various ways. You could actually do a proficiency test to assure that, verify that you can operate the procedure, or perhaps uh, checks against a good reference value that you may have in place. Either way, I'm looking for records of verification. So uh, before um, issuing, and if for whatever reason the, the method was revised by the issuing body, uh, sh verification shall be repeated to the extent necessary. So these are not these are methods that you've adopted that you're following. You might you you have not necessarily developed or altered. You're just following it. Uh, need to uh, verify that you can operate the, uh, excuse me, um, perform the procedure and uh, obtain the uh, required results. 7221, this is validate. So this would be if perhaps you are writing your, val your uh, own method or using a non-standard method, then you have to validate it. And you have to have records of this validation. Again, uh, um, Records have to be produced, i.e. proficiency testing, particularly through a third party. Again, reference values, uh, good reference values uh, established where you can go back and assure that the, your, uh, your uh, non-standard method or laboratory method uh, um, were able to uh, repeat their desired results. So here's an example of a non-conformance written. Like I said, it has to be appropriate procedures. And if the procedure is being followed, it, it needs to be uh, followed as it's written. If it deviates from, then you're not uh, following it. And that's an example of uh, this particular non-conformance um, where the uh, finding was a balance calibration. It's not following all elements of the Euromet CG18 procedure. So this particular uh, non-conformance was written during the demonstration. Um, the calibration witness uh, corresponding report produced did not utilize at least five, five readings to capture repeatability along with capturing the errors of indicated uh, indication at various loads. So uh, this particular non-conformance was written against 17025 clause 7211. The laboratory shall use appropriate methods and procedure for all activities were appropriate for the evaluation of measurement uncertainties as well as statistical data for analyzing of that in this particular case uh, they were stating they were using a method but uh, saying and doing were, were two different things in this particular instance hence the writing of this non-conformance all 
Okay, uh, moving on down the list here, uh, number four. This is from the 17025 standard section 77, which is ensuring the validity of results. I think this is an important section. A laboratory needs to take to heart. Um, it emphasizes interlaboratory comparison. Um, there's uh, compliance to this section will interject beneficial tools for the laboratory to check the reliability of their results by comparison within their peer group and to demonstrate their performance to clients and accreditation bodies. With the increasing availability of proficiency testing schemes in many technical fields, the criteria for selecting of an appropriate schemes are becoming more important. So, um, section 7.7, seven, we have 771, and we see the word uh, shall here. So this is a section a laboratory needs to have a procedure for. Um, and this is include the monitoring of the validity of results. The result data shall be recorded in such a way that trains are detected, and where practical, the statistical techniques shall be applied <clears throat> to review the results. This monitoring shall be planned and reviewed and include where appropriate, but not limited to. And there's a listing of items there, A through K. Blind, te blind um, testing, uh, intra-lab testing is included in here. Even checking the results. Um, so uh, one thing with 771, these are all internal controls. These are things where you can uh, just check in the results and ensuring um, reliability from that and maintain within the four walls of your organization. All right, um, as opposed to 772, and then we see the word shall. Um, the laboratory shall monitor its performance by comparison with results of other laboratories. And we have bolded there. We're going to expand on this a little bit more here in this presentation. Where available and appropriate. Uh, this monitoring shall be planned and reviewed and shall include but not limited to either both of the following. Participation in proficiency testing, i.e. third-party testing is defining our PL1 or participation in interlaboratory comparison. So in other words, um, um, you need to be, and this is uh, when the standard was revised, this is a, a new requirement that wasn't in there in 2005. You have to compare your results to results outside of your organization, where available and appropriate. And uh, also your data. Um, and I've seen proficiency testing was even just uh, here's here's our data and here's their data. Bang, we're done our proficiency testing. No, <laughs> um, you have to analyze the data. Um, so in other words, what's that data showing? Were you in agreement? Were you not in agreement? <clears throat> Excuse me. So it shall be analyzed, used to control, if applicable, improve the laboratory activities. If the results of analysis and data from monitoring activities are found outside of predefined uh, criteria appropriate action shall be taken to prevent incorrect results from being reported. So uh, you're not only you're required to uh, perform these these um, requirements specified in here in 77. Um, if you're comparing your results to another organization, hey, if they're not in if they don't agree with each other, the buck don't stop there. Hey, an investigation has to be perform and if needed, uh, uh, corrective action may need to be taken. So uh, following on on that train of saw, here's an example of a finding of a finding. Proficiency testing results do not show analysis between ABC and XYZ results. The data needs to state criteria to which uh, to which is being used to determine whether or not they are in agreement. Uh, with each other, such as an EN analysis, for example, e-normal analysis. And uh, what was submitted here, and this was probably where, okay, here's our data, here's their data. Um, nothing else was submitted, so this was a proficiency testing that was submitted. Uh, there's the requirement there that we just went over about the, um, analyzing the data. So it's uh, not it's more than here's us and here's them. Uh, what are you using to base uh, 
based whether or not they are in agreement with each other and were they in agreement with each other. All right, and this is kind of interesting. If you think about this, 7-7 uh, um, seven, seven is followed by PL1. They're basically, they're related to the same item or same category uh, here, this encompassing um, proficiency testing. So these, this is PJLA's policy on proficiency testing. So we did write a, a fair amount of findings uh, just uh, direct at 7-7, seven, seven, but here's uh, down on the list also with proficiency testing. So right here, if you're an applicant organization, um, and it, I call this a slam dunk, uh, you have to get proficiency testing before you're accredited. So if we go in and do an initial assessment, if proficiency testing hasn't been completed, within um, the guidelines set forth in PL1, a non-conformance uh, uh, will be uh, written. So if you're in the process of uh, being accredited, uh, you want to make sure that you're, you successfully completed your initial uh, proficiency test prior to the initial assessment. And in short, it meets the requirements of uh, 17025, or excuse me, of PL1 the proficiency test schemes that are um, defined there. Tagging along there, even once you're accredited, uh, even if you're accredited to do just one line item on your scope, uh, proficiency testing is performed to be um, completed annually. So prior to getting accredited, you have to do proficiency testing. It has to be completed. Um, once you are accredited, hey, it's not a one-time thing every time we do an assessment, we're gonna be looking for your proficiency testing results. PL, PL, excuse me, PL1 goes into uh, a lot of dissertation about a four-year plan. So an organization has to develop their four-year proficiency testing plan. And uh, PL1 goes into detail as to uh, how to construct one where we have to include each discipline on a scope of accreditation every four uh, within a four-year period. And a uh, requirement that's written um, in PL1 um, that piggy piggybacks on that requirement in 7-7 seven, in seven, seven specifying um, you have to compare your results to results outside your organization. Uh, we have this written into PL1. So re recall that it's stated in 17025, where available and appropriate. There are instances where it, it is not. Um, one, one common example is a truck scale. Um, kind of hard to conduct an interlab test and there are no third party providers. There are some, some, more, some proficiency testing where you may get approved to do intralab testing. Um, if there are a known third party uh, provider, Chances are it is not going to get approved, but uh, if you uh, uh, feel you have in a, um, you fall in that, that scheme where it is not available and it is appropriate to do a uh, intralab test, and it, when I'm speaking about an intralab test, that's done within the four confines of your organization. So, for example, if you have technician A, B, C, D, say A was the senior technician, they would run a test or calibration and B, C, D would follow and you would compare the results to, to uh, perhaps a reference value that was established within the labs. Uh, repeatability studies, uh, that's basically what it is. That's the bottom of the pecking order. Perhaps uh, it's basically repeating the measurement, seeing if you can repeat it. The biggest problem with that that I see is, yes, you could be repeat it, but uh, you are, uh, are you repeating the right result? So if you're an organization, you feel you fill, you uh, fall into this category, even if you're in line, if you're not yet accredited and you've done your research and you feel you cannot do an interlab test, or a third party test, you can't find a third party provider, then you need to state your case. So we put put it put it on the um, the organization to state in writing why third party or inter lab comparisons are not feasible and how they plan to conduct the test and analyze the data. Um, this needs to be submitted to headquarters and it needs to be approved. So if uh, 
if a four-year plan, if you submit a four-year plan and it includes intra-lab testing, and you cannot show where that you um, put that request in writing, and it's been approved, then a non-conformance can be written against uh, against um, PL1 in that instance. So uh, here's an example of non-conformance is written in this uh, in, uh, uh, in regards to PL1. Interlab proficiency testing yielded EN failures with no investigation or corrective action. Interlab comparison of ABC uh, lab with ABC calibration lab, EN failures at 10 microliters and 100 microliters, it was probably a pipette, um, dated 11 August 2021. So um, this particular instance, yes, they probably did the proficiency test. They established predefined limits. Um, however, those agreements, they were not in agreement with each other, hence uh, uh, did not show any corrective action or an investigation as to uh, why they were not in agreement with each other. It might necessitate a retest or uh, perhaps including uh, resubmitting the data um, to another party to, to, to um to compare with. Uh, problems sometimes with an interlab test, if it's just bare bones minimum is two two organizations that are doing it. So if uh, for whatever reason, if they don't compare, then uh, you may be fine. It may be the other CAB. So uh, if everything does compare, everything's fine, you're in agreement, you do an e-normal analysis and it shows everything passed, then, then it's fine. Um, however, if it comes up red, does not pass. Hey, you need to stop. You need to investigate and uh, determine. Hey, what what went went wrong here? Particularly if you did a third party test. If you're not familiar with what that is, um, folks are in the business of doing proficiency testing provider. Everything is confidential. So sometimes I hear uh, a request that uh, they have proprietary rights. Well, with third party tests, you're given a code say code eight one two three and everybody else is presented a code so you you know what your code is or but uh, nobody else does and vice versa so everybody's numbers with results uh there so particularly if you fail a third party test then chances are you're going to have to take corrective action and you're probably going to have to hold your uh, testing your calibration and see what's going on and get it corrected another finding like i, I stated once you are uh required to do once you are uh, accredited uh you have to do proficiency testing annually so uh assure that you're uh, able to show your assessor your annual proficiency testing because that is a requirement in pl1 all right uh, number two getting down the bottom of the list here uh final product uh 7.8 resulting reporting the results so i said final product uh uh, what I what I mean is this is the result of everything uh, which uh, um, goes into your testing and calibration. So you have competent folks, you have traceability, you have proper equipment and, and doing proper or, or appropriate procedures uh, for the testing and calibration. You end up uh, producing a report that goes to your customer. So this is a uh, section seven, eight, that actual report that you're producing your customers. Uh, 17025 includes, uh, this is a, a standard for testing, calibration, and sampling. So this section covers all three areas. So I just want to interject something here, uh, mentioning an internal audit. Again, uh, when you see the word shall, and you see that a lot here in, in uh, reporting the result, the laboratory shall report, that indicates a requirement. Uh, should indicates a recommendation, may indicates a permission, <coughs> and can a possibility or capability. So when we look at section seven, eight, uh, reporting the results, it's broken down into different areas. So you want to take that word shall and you want to review it, uh, particularly if you're doing your internal audit, reports that you produced, and you want to assure that you're capturing all the applicable shalls to your customer. Um, section 782 is requirements for all three, testing, calibration, and sampling. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, 783 is specific to test reports. 
784 is specific to calibration certs, and 785 is specific to uh, um, sampling results. Um, 7861 is, is a section that is specified um, for making statements of conformity. So um, this was a new requirement that was bought into the standard when it was revised. So these, this is a decision rule. So your reports have to document your decision rule, which if you don't know what that is, it's a, um, basically uh, it's defined in 17025 is how you take measurement uncertainty into account. So um, that is if you're stating pass, fail, um, intolerance, out of tolerance, anything to that effect, um, you're required, and actually putting the cart before the horse here, under 713, under contract review, your requ standard requires you to communicate and capture your customer's agreement as to your decision rule. And then under 7861, that decision rule that the customer agrees to needs to be documented on the report, which could be anything from strict guard banding to the concept of simple acceptance. If, if uh, if uh, appropriate and agreed to with the customer, that uh, needs to be captured on the report. So uh, examples of non-conformances written uh, during the last calendar year. Um, reports not captured, of course, all required elements stated within 17025. And objective evidence was uh, um, with our assessments, um, this is it's a sampling process. So we don't look at every report we do a sampling of them. So this was a report that was pulled during the sampling process and looking at all applicable requirements for the organization that uh, had that word shall associated with it. Under 7821, uh, items that was not captured and prompted the writing of the nonconformist was uh, 7821F, identification of the method used, J, the date of issue of the report, and O, oh, identification of the person authorizing the report. So uh, we spoke about that a little bit in personnel, that uh, that person um, has to be, uh, <coughs> the identification that person authorized needs to be identified on the report. And that person also in 6-2 uh, laboratory needs to show a record that that individual was authorized to um, uh, release the report. All right, we are at the bottom of the list, and um, the area that we uh, at PJLA now um, had the most uh, findings uh, was in regards to 17025, section 64, which is equipment. So looking at uh, various requirements here under equipment, uh, 644. Uh, a laboratory shall verify that equipment performs to specified requirements before being placed or returned to service. <clears throat> equipment used for measurement shall be capable of, achieve, of, of achieving the uh, measurement accuracy and or measurement uncertainty required to provide a valid result. Equipment calibration, so uh, it may also crosswalk into traceability here. Your equipment has to be calibrated when the accuracy, excuse me, the measurement accuracy or measurement uncertainty affects the validity of the reports and where metrological traceability is needed. So if it's needed in order for a traceable measurement to be uh, um, supported, uh, that equipment needs to have a traceable calibration report to accompany it. Uh, also in this talks about defective equipment. So any item that was determined to be uh, not operating correctly, it needs to be uh, isolated, ideally removed from the testing or calibration at, um, lab and should be uh, um, labeled as to as out of service um, uh, status. And if it was actually used to uh, perform customer um, testing or calibration and was determined after the fact to be to, to be operating outside specified requirements, then uh, you're going to have to turn the keys on your um, what you have in place for Section 710, uh, which is uh, non-conforming work, and see if it actually impacted any of the 
results that you produced and then take a appropriate action as defined in section 710. When intermediate checks are necessary to maintain confidence in the performance of equipment, these checks shall be carried out according to a procedure. So perhaps you're a testing lab and you have controlled samples, maybe blanks and spikes worked in. Um, that should be defined according to procedure. Uh, perhaps uh, another example would be check and balances. Uh, you have uh, analytical type balances that you're doing weighing um, on and uh, have a, a, an intermediate check perhaps once a week where you'll uh, have some traceable test weights and assure that the balances are operating within specific uh, predetermined limits that, that was set forth by your organization. Here's an example of a non-conformance rating. Proposed scope of accreditation. and this is a fictitious company stating analytical type balances. However, Manny, Mo, and Jack's uh, scale and balance companies do not have class one weights needed to perform these calibrations. Current uh, weights are class F. Um, objective evidence that was uh, shown here was uh, it was unable to show the standard. They were showing they had class F where they needed to have class class one. Hence, they didn't have the appropriate equipment and the nonconformist was written under 641 without having uh, access to um, equipment. Uh, including but not limited to measurement instruments, software, measurement standards, reference material, reference data, reagents, consumable or auxiliary apparatus. This is required for the correct performance of laboratory activities that can influence the results. So in this particular example, the organization did not have the correct classification of test weights. So that takes us down the list uh, 10 through 1 uh, as far as the common areas that nonconformances were written in 17025. So uh, bear with me one moment. Uh, I need to uh, change gears here. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning here, you could type in questions and I'll review them. And ideally, I answer them to the best of my ability here. How do we evaluate the competency requirements of all laboratory of functions? Uh, please explain. Uh, sampling quality control, and I'm reading these, these as, as they were typed in. And quality assurance. Uh, please explain, give an example. So I'm assuming you're talking about section uh, 6 2. Um, which is a section on personnel. So just bear in mind, under 6.2, competency requirements. Um, you are required under 6.2 um, to uh, document the competencies requirements for each function, i.e. not just the folks that are doing the testing and calibration, but as I mentioned before, the internal auditor. Um, and to ensure personnel have the competencies uh, to perform laboratory activities. I believe some of the examples I gave, one thing I sort of emphasized was proficiency testing. So um, if you're doing proficiency testing, particularly uh, inter-lab testing, you incorporate, that could be objective evidence showing that the, uh, as far as, um, I'm trying to read your question again here, how to evaluate the competencies that they are, uh, producing the uh, desired results within the interlab proficiency test. And if you have several technicians that are doing the proficiency test, um, assure that everybody is give it, getting a, um, reported results with the uniformity that you would expect. <clears throat> it could be as simple as checking the work. I, one thing I can sort of relay here, PJLA, we have similar requirements under 17025. Uh, excuse me, 17011, which uh, we are um, assessed to under our ILAC MRA. Um, and uh, we have to train assessors, even if they are technically have the background in there. 
And uh, we do that uh, typically uh, through our course, our training, and having what we call various scenarios or case studies that's presented, and also given a written exam at the end of it all, just to assure that they they are competent and have acquired the knowledge through through our training program where they can move forward. So there are a few examples that you can can utilize. Uh, one when I was on your side of the table, I was involved in testing a little bit. Uh, I didn't know anything about the test. I was managing the lab though, <clears throat> where we I did blind um sample testing where i would actually have some samples that were already tested um interject um, incorporated into the the lot to be tested and um the uh, technician would test it where i can co co compare the results with uh the uh, initial results that's what's a blind testing they're testing the sample they have no idea not sure where the sample came from for all they know they could be testing a sample that they already tested uh, within the year all right uh, going down the list here can the use of internal control sample for a method be used as evidence for compliance to seven seven yes i would say definitely um that would fall within uh, one of those uh, buckets there under 7.7 for internal control. Trying to read the question, see if I missed something, but that was a uh, reference uh, uh, results for specific reference values. That was one of the line items. Uh, Intralab testing as well was one of the line items that uh, this could be sort of used in conjunction is. And bear in mind, I'm a calibration assessor. So some of these technical questions, um, I am not gonna attempt to answer because I am not qualified to answer them. That's not, not my area. And I'm trying to digest the uh, the meaning of this question here. Um, And I'm sorry, this question in regards to uh, reference material. I'm, uh, I'll go ahead and read it. If anybody else knows the answer, uh, uh, please uh, type it in and I'll interject it. When developing a procedure for method validation, i.e. you are going to validate, I guess, a lab developed method and verification or determine whether you can uh, operate a, uh, a known method, how do you put to use quality control parameters and reference materials? also in absence of a true value for method comparison. How is this handled? Thank you. Well, the only thing, you know, sort of think of, think about that, you could establish, and I could be off base here with your particular area of testing, but a control chart, if you have something in place here where you get repeated measurements over a period of time, where you have a um, average value over a period of time, and then you establish control limits from there, i.e. based on standard deviations. So basically you could establish control limits, uh, assure you're within two standard deviations of the value, of the, um, the measurement mean, i.e. two standard deviations being a warning limit, uh, three standard deviations being a uh, out of control limits where you are, uh, you are not uh, repeating the result uh, where it's been repeated in the past. So that's one one way I would assume you could do it without a known recorded value on the reference material is through your own internal checks and repeated reason, readings and obtaining an average uh, value there. I hope, hope uh, hopefully I <laughs> didn't go too, too astray there. What is the main difference between validation and verification of a method? Uh, use a, a may OEM for recalibration or calibration. Is there a procedure or guidance for assessing them as a calibrator? Well, verification and validation. Verification is just assuring that you can um, 
you can perform the method. It's not something that you are developing. Um, I mentioned a scope expansion during the presentation. Say you want to go into doing torque wrenches. Well, you have the equipment. Uh, you may have a procedure you got from ASTDAM, even perhaps GUIDAM, something, something to that nature. You want to go ahead and follow that protocol, and you want to make sure and verify that you can operate that already established procedure. Uh, validation of method would be um, where it's it's not it's a procedure out there um, that you might be deviating from, or you're writing your own internal procedure. You need to validate that uh, you can act that the procedure not only that you can operate the procedure, but validate the procedure itself. And this particular says is, is asking if I use uh, OEM, which is manufacturer methods for recalibration um, standards, is there a list procedure for guidelines for assessing them as a calibrator? So um, yeah, would you be like any other other method if you're calibrating a uh, perhaps let's throw an analytical balance there. Um, in those manuals, they have procedures for calibrating those those um, those balances. And if you're stating you're following OEM methods to calibrate a balance, then uh, the particular make and model, then that would be considered the method if that's what you're you're stating, and you should be following that uh, that method. So, just like any other uh, uh, method, um, going to the balance uh, um, example again. Um, uh, mentioned something about a nonconformist written against the Euromat CG method, uh, uh, eight, excuse me, 18 method, which is a nationally recognized method for calibrating balances. Um, either both of them are considered uh, methods. Um, you'd have to hang your hat on, you know, whether the manufacturer method is um, is appropriate. Um, and you can certainly claim them as your internal method, just as long as you're following them. They're they're documented and they're recognized. I'm going down the list here, some of these are running together, making sure I'm getting them all here. Here's, uh, I guess this is a calibration. They are NIST, but not uh, 17025. Um, we have someone coming in to train with one of our technicians. What is a good way to validate and approve this person as a supplier? Um, they are doing this on their own. Someone who does electrical calibration, but is not with a training company. I can just speak on behalf of an uh, um, assessor. Um, and we we're talking about uh you know slam dunks yes if it's going to be through an accredited source a couple ways you can do this um if it's going to be not be done through an accredited source then you have to go through the lf 123 route for non-accredited sources and uh there's six elements of traceability there um so uh or it could be considered an in-house calibration so an in-house calibration is when you're doing your own uh, calibrations internally there, you're not going through an external source. So often see that with test labs with calibration. And I can tell you they're assessed just like a traceable calibration. So as a accreditating body, we need to know that uh, these, um, well, if we're handling it as an in-house calibration, uh, we need to assure um, that we know that these in-house calibrations because an assessor competent in that area will have to uh, assess that. So basically, yep, if, it, if, if traceability is needed for this particular electrical uh, calibration that you're performing, then the requirements of 17025 need to be met, either through the uh, um, realm of the, uh, uh, of the LF-123, where you have to show objective evidence of 
the report, the, the, the final report that's being produced. There's elements that need to be on there. Uncertainty. So with uh, by definition, uh, traceability in it includes uncertainty. <clears throat> so the individual will have to establish um, the measurement uncertainty and ideally present an uncertainty budget that identifies all the relevant contributors. Uh, assure that they have some sort of internal measurement assurance program in place. Uh, ideally, uh, in this particular area, you know, if they participated in proficiency testing uh, or perhaps uh, they establish a uh, internal control, such as a control chart or uh, some of the objective evidence that uh, we would be looking for. And then also, uh, last but not least, what are they using to calibrate your equipment? Uh, that's got to have a traceable report. And I can tell you in an assessor, if, if we get to that level and that measurement are not traceable, probably not going to go any further. So their, their equipment that they're using to calibrate your equipment, that would need to be traceable. And it's stated if you want, if it's going to be considered an internal type employee, Look at our policy on traceability under in-house calibration. Basically, it's handled just like an accredited calibration, except it's not listed on the scope. So we would look at the, the competencies of the individual uh, with calibration. You know, uncertainty is going to be different on it as opposed probably if you're a testing person that there's established, that they're reasonable. Um, a method, uh, appropriate methods are being used. So it would be assessed just like a uh, regular calibration. I hope I answered your question there. I know I went around in a little bit of a circle there with a couple couple different things there. Yes, the uh, we went over that at the very beginning. That the recording of this will be available on the PGLA website. Um, just go to the webinar tab, and there is also a link just for the slides. So you can go uh, go there. You can request a slide. And I have somebody that agreed with me, so that's good to hear uh, about my uh, control chart sam uh, um, scenario where you didn't have a, uh, a good reference value for a reference material. Did you say there was a checklist on the PGLA website for internal audits? It's a tool that can be used to support your internal audit. Um, and actually, it's the same checklist that we use when we um, do assessments with. Um, under forms, uh, resources forms under checklist, uh, if you have something, you can write this down. It's the LF56 for ISO 17025-2017. You can get that right off our website. And basically, it goes through the whole standard and in question format, asking you, um, uh, you would be asking yourself, you know, these questions of your organization. So it can be used to support an internal audit. One thing with an internal audit, uh, one of my pet peeves is that internal audit is more than a bunch of check marks. So uh, we'd like to see uh, clear objective evidence. And there is a comment section of what was looked at uh, with making that state when you decided, uh, hey, you're in compliance or you weren't in compliance with a particular area of the standard. Hi, I think I'm reading um, this question here. Um, if a calibrator shown inaccurate measurements in some readings, although it just, I guess, came back from its annual calibration, what's the sequence of, of uh, action should a lab follow? Okay, so I'm going to make an assumption here. Um, so <laughs> hopefully my assumption is correct, and I'm not answering your question here. So I'm assuming the uh, cal the calibrator of your equipment stated that you you were out of tolerance. Your equipment was out of tolerance. So what you have to consider there was that means if well, first of all, was the equipment used on any customer reports? So that's the first question you need to ask yourself. If not then, uh, you know, as far as um, anything action on your part, you just want to uh, 
assure that uh, you, you continue to use it wise in, in tolerance. Calibration is not a one-time thing. You want to establish a reasonable calibration interval. Where is an issue is if you got it back, it was used on customer reports and it was out of tolerance. So if you think about that, you were using equipment on customers' uh, test or calibration reports that were out of tolerance. Hence, I need to uh, re refer you to Section 710, Non-Conforming Work. And you can go to our, <laughs> I mentioned our webinars are recorded. I did one not too long ago on non-conforming work. You can go back and listen to it as far as the sequence. So basically, in a nutshell, what you need to do is an impact analysis. So uh, <clears throat> based on, you have to go, how far back do you have to go? Well, you have to go back as far as the last time the instrument was determined to be intolerance. So if you have nothing in place between calibrations, then you would have to go back to the point where you got the instrument back because it could have gone out of calibration any time um, after that point. So it could have gone out of calibration the day after you got it back or the day that you sent it. So we talked about equipment and intermediate checks. So ideally, if you have a good system of intermediate checks, you could sense a drift. So um, uh, you ask you know, what you need to follow an impact analysis, need to make the determination. Did it affect any of your customers' uh, uh, reports that you put out? Did it affect their results? And worst case scenario takes it as far as uh, um, having to contact those customers and, and recall the work. So uh, I'm assuming that's what you're referring there uh, uh, to um, out of tolerance condition. Is there an ISO procedure for the verification of non-ISO 17025's lab being used to calibrate your equipment? Not specified, well, um, sort of we correlate that in with our PL2. Um, so uh, we reference uh, a form, an LF123. Again, they could be, <coughs> be used, uh, they could typically, they could be providing traceable measurements and uh, not be accredited. And some of the things that, that I highlighted before that I, I would look at if I'm looking at a non-accredited source for calibration would be, well, first of all, the report. Does it identify your instrument, it, you know, traceable, what standards were used? That sort of thing needs to be captured on the report. Again, the measurement uncertainty. By definition, it needs to have, they need to have a valid measurement uncertainty that takes into account all the significant contributors. Um, and then their equipment. What was what was uh, that they used to calibrate your equipment? Well, who calibrated that? Was that from a traceable source? And then any sort of internal controls, uh, uh, proficiency testing control charts, something like that, to assure the uh, um, reliability of of uh, their calibration. So we address it. ISO doesn't uh, address it. Uh, you can go back to Appendix uh, B, I believe it is. Uh, which uh, goes through uh, some additional information on traceability, but that's what we base our LF-123 on. All right, so let's see if I got any more here. All right, somebody thank you for the presentation. Got a lot out of it, which was always a goal of mine. So uh, a lot of good questions there. Like I said, we covered a lot of ground there because we covered a lot of areas. Uh, hopefully I answered everybody's question uh, sufficiently. Uh, before we go, I just want to uh, put up next month's uh, webinar, which is already um, <coughs> excuse me, um, scheduled for February 22nd. It's a Tuesday. We're going to look at Section 7.1, Review Request Tenders and Contracts, uh, um, during February. So, uh, again, th I appreciate everybody signing in. Again, this webinar is will be available um, on our website shortly, uh, the recorded version, and also the slides. So, uh, um, look forward to seeing everybody logging back in February. We'll dissect 7.1 in detail. Thank you.